This week we're going to focus on the cost of information and how we can make sure that we are using information resources legally. This presentation is going to be split into two parts. In this one we will be talking about how much information can cost, how the library works to get what you need, and the open access movement. The next presentation will look at copyright and fair use. This is an apt picture because navigating these issues can be like walking a tightrope, one that has expensive and legal consequences if you don't get it right. These are the areas we're going to cover this week. Very exciting, right? While these might not be the most thrilling things to study, it is important that you know how to use information correctly and legally. To be honest, issues of journal prices, database licenses, and copyright give even librarians a headache. You may think that you don't have to worry about issues of copyright and how much journals cost, but it does impact you as a student. You may get frustrated when you find that the library doesn't own a certain journal when you absolutely need the article for your research paper. I swear it's not because we're trying to ruin your chances for getting a good grade, we just can't buy everything. You may experience an issue when you try to log into a database and it won't let you in. The license may be restricting the amount of users or may not allow access from off campus. We will also touch upon open access, which matters as the push for freely available resources can make your research easier, even when you're lo no longer a student. Ooh, a graph! How exciting! The blue line represents the consumer price index, which is a measure of the average prices people pay for goods. The red bars represent the average cost of a journal for libraries. It's very easy to see that the cost of journals far exceeds the CPI. Inflation on journal prices is kind of insane. Some journal prices have increased as much as 145% in under 10 years. One very painful example is that one of the pharmacy journals to which the library used to subscribe to increased its price 177 percent in one year. To give you some perspective, we generally budget for a 5 to 7 percent increase in our journal prices from year to year, so we had to cancel this journal because it was just too much. While journal prices go up and up, the library budget is going down or is flat. That is a problem. If libraries want to be able to keep the journals we have, we end up cutting back on books and other services, or canceling subscriptions to journals altogether. And it's not even just small libraries that are feeling the pinch. As one of your readings this week will show, even Harvard University, one of the wealthiest universities in the world, cannot afford what journals are charging. So why are journals so expensive for libraries? First. I'm no economics expert, but even I know that the less competition there is in the market, the more those businesses can charge for their product. This is what has happened as the big publishers have bought up the smaller places. Yes, this is another exciting chart, but what it says is very important. More than 60 publishers are now controlled by just six companies. Also, there are more and more articles published every year, and this has led to the creation of specialty journals which can charge more for their product because they know that those interested in that area really want that information and they'll pay, or try to make their library pay. This graph shows the increase in the number of articles published in just one database. It's astonishing. Another factor is the issue of publish or perish. Have you ever heard of it? Probably, especially if you've been in college for a while or have family and friends who work in college or for university. Faculty have to do research and publish papers in order to get tenure. The, they get more points for papers published in peer-reviewed journals and more prestige from papers published in what are termed high-impact journals. These are journals that are cited a lot. These journals know that they're popular and so they can charge more, knowing that libraries will have to pay. And one of the final reasons for the high cost of journals for libraries is that we pay for everyone on campus to have access, and this makes things much more costly than a subscription for just one person. So, while I may be able to get a personal subscription to Entertainment Weekly for $25 a year, the library may have to pay about $10,000 a year for the specialty journal Biochemical Pharmacology. Do you think $10,000 for a journal is expensive? You might want to sit down before hearing about database prices. First, what do we mean when we talk about databases? Databases are online resources 
that can provide access to journal articles, newspapers, and other specialized information. You might be familiar with the EBSCO database from searching it in high school or from a different college class. Using a database usually allows you to search for many journals and other sources all at once, which really saves time. And many of our databases provide you a PDF copy of the article as well. Most databases are specialized. We have databases for nursing, economics, art, dance, and even more. This specialization makes it easier to find information specific to what you need. But that convenience comes at a price. Database subscriptions are a pretty big chunk of every library's budget, with some going for $50,000 or more every year. Just like with journals, we don't have a personal vendetta against you if we don't have or end up canceling your favorite database. We just can't afford it all. Now we'll talk briefly about licensing. No, not a driver's license or a fishing license. Those are fun at least. This type of licensing has to do with paying for databases and for providing access to online books and similar information. Database licensing means that we pay for access to the resource. We rent more than we own it. Kind of like a Netflix subscription. The rules for using information in a database or other licensed resource vary wildly, which can be very frustrating. Some of these allow all ISU faculty, staff, and students to use the resources both on and off campus. Some databases are only available to certain groups, like the pharmacy school. And some resources can only be used within the Pocatello Library. This may make lawyers very happy, but it gives the rest of us a major headache. One of the things that can be hard to get your head around is that we only have access to databases as long as we're paying for them. Again, think of this like Netflix. So, if a database gets canceled or cut out of the budget, we lose access to it completely. It doesn't matter if we've been paying for it for a whole decade. The information is locked away if you don't pay. So, if it's so much trouble, why bother? The information you can find, including full text articles, cannot be duplicated using a free search tool like Google. Most of the library databases are just too valuable to the research process to give up. Many researchers publish articles in order to promote knowledge and further enhance their subject area, not because they're looking to get rich. Most journal authors don't get paid anything. So it can be quite annoying when what they publish is restricted to only those who can afford to pay for the journal. So many started to look for a new way to publish where what they wrote could be freely accessible to all. This is called open access. It's no coincidence that the field of open access journals started up about the same time that journal prices started going nuts. It was a direct reaction to what many researchers, scientists, and librarians felt were unfair practices and prices from the big publisher. In 1990, a group of about 35,000 scholars wrote something called an open letter to scientific publishers that requested what they called an online public library that would offer free access to the world's research. When that had no impact on the big publishers, no surprise there, they formed the Public Library of Science and started publishing the journal PLOS as an open access journal in 2003. Just like everything, including traditional journals, there's a wide range in the quality of open access journals out there. So how is open access different than traditional publishing other than the cost of the journal? In traditional publishing, the journal makes its money by charging the readers and libraries. In open access, the journal makes its money by charging the authors when they submit their articles. That's not a bad system if the author has the financial backing of a university or a grant, but it can really hurt those who can't come up with the submission fees. These fees can range from anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 an article. And this isn't the only method, though. If you ever decide to look more deeply into the exciting topic of open access, you will see reference to gold and green routes. These are simply different ways to make sure the article or other material is made freely available. Okay, a review. This week is designed to make you aware that libraries are struggling with ever-increasing journal prices and that our database licensing is also pricey and frustrating. This has a direct impact on you because the more things cost, the more we have to cut, as library budgets are not unlimited. Open access is a relatively new and exciting way of making information available by transferring the cost to the creators of the research versus the readers. I know this isn't the most exciting information to cover, but you definitely will know more about the budgets and struggles of a library now. 
we hope you come to appreciate the value of what you have access to as an ISU student and how using library resources for research can be better than just a Google search. Okay, here are the assignments you'll be expected to complete by the end of this week. There are two presentations this week, the one you just watched and the next one which covers issues of copyright and fair use. There are also a few short readings within Moodle this week. Make sure that you post to the discussion forum and respond to the post of at least one of your classmates. The quiz this week will be 10 questions which will come from the presentations and the readings. The quiz is open note, so feel free to review the materials if needed.